So I'm Howard Pritchard, Los Alamos. Um, I am approaching the, what I want to discuss today from both from the perspective of an open, uh, from an MPI developer looking down, and also uh, from uh, someone who's working with some of these network APIs, a little more than some than others, um, looking up. Um, and I'm going to take a different sort of tact from Ken's talk because I wanted to focus more on. Let's see, button do I press to do? Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. How some of these network APIs that we've been uh, talking about, um, how they impact what we're doing in OpenMPI now. Uh, I somehow got, I don't know if the word is suckered or volunteered, into being a release manager for uh, version 2 of OpenMPI, uh, the release stream 2, along with Jeff Squire. So some of that feeds into what I want to talk about today. I'll talk a little bit about how um, the MPI our release cycle in the background uh, for that and then dive into a little bit about the MPI internals, open MPI internals, and focusing on how that they interoperate with uh, various network APIs and then get into a little controversy about lessons learned and if we have time a brief advertisement. Uh, so open MPI is on GitHub. It's, it is open source and it's not just open source but especially since it's on GitHub, if you ever use GitHub, it's, I, in my mind, it's one of the greatest things that hit software development in the last 20 years, and I've been around longer than that. Um, it's a, a community of industry partners, government labs, and universities. There are lots of users. It's widely used on IB clusters. I mentioned that because that's obviously one of the things we talk about a lot here. Uh, if you want more information about uh, how to contribute, uh, report bugs and stuff, uh, there's a GitHub wiki page link embedded in that on the, um, on the slide there. Okay, so I want to talk about our release cycle. Um, once you get somehow involved in release management, you think about this a lot more than you maybe used to before when you're just writing software. So in this diagram, time is going from left to right. And I think about a year and a half ago, uh, it some of the vendors really wanted to get features into this so-called 1.8 release stream, which at the time was the stable release stream. At that time, the way we were doing our release cycles is you'd have a 1.x where x is odd is called a feature stream, and then a 1.x plus 1, the even number, was the stable stream. And what we were finding was that it would take forever for our end users or our users to switch from what was our release stream to what would be our stable release stream going forward. They would be back one or two of these uh, releases and we'd have to be going back and working with like OpenMPI 1.4 and it just wasn't working. Uh, but in order to switch to a new method, we had several vendors who really wanted to make sure that if we, if we were gonna go to this new, new mechanism, they wouldn't, get the, they wouldn't have to wait till like 20, uh, till late 2016 potentially to get features into what would become a stable release branch in the future. So what we did is a one-time thing of, we took the 1.8 release branch, which was the stable one, and we morphed it, we dropped 1.9, there's no 1.9, and it became this 1.10. And one of the things that went into this, and one of the drivers, but not the only one, Mellanox had a feature they wanted to get into, was the introduction of this libfabric, aka OFI, MTL, and that went into to our master, uh, this master branch, uh, end of 2014, and about the time in May when we decided uh, to, to really go forward with this scheme, it was uh, checked into this 1.8 at the same time we were branching off into 1.10. Currently, 1.10.2 is the official stable release, so if someone who's not using a Cray uh, wants, the, um, wants the latest and best stable release, you go with 1.10.2, and that includes this libfabric OFIMTL. Uh, so we naturally picked up in what will be our next uh, stable release, which is the 2X series. Uh, it was already in master, so we picked it up when we branched, and we branched in about uh, June of last year. Uh, a little, somewhat later on, um, we added OpenUCX, uh, Mellanox added OpenUCX actually, uh, to, to the various branches. By that time, we had three branches going. So in addition to getting into master, which I think happened in, all oh right, September 15, 
month later we added it into the 2x release uh, stream and then also uh, put it back into the to the um, stable branch and so 110 has both open UCX PML and I'll explain a little bit about these uh, abbreviations in a little bit and the libfabric OFI MTL uh, we're expecting a maintenance release in 1103 probably late this month um, if the stars align and the gods are happy uh, sometime in April, late April, we're hoping to uh, release this to OX. Actually, one of the delays in releasing this to OX is related to these APIs, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. Oh, wrong thing. Okay. So, I, I'd like to have boxes and things. I think that's better than text. So, what I wanted to show in this slide was the stacks of OpenMPI and how they end up connecting the application up here at the top down to the network at the bottom. So obviously the first layer you have, any MPI implementation has this, is the part that actually interfaces to the application and supports the MPI API. In Open MPI below that, um, uh, it's actually structured very differently from the MPitch. Uh, they the architects of this thing long before my time, what they tried to do with C, they tried to do in C what you do like in Java or C++, and they have this notion of this multi-component architecture. And the way that works is let's say you have a certain type of functionality you want, but you have multiple variants of it depending on, for instance, the OS you're operating on or the underlying network you want to use. Uh, you'll have kind of a base class, and then on top of that base class, you'll have these derived classes which actually implement uh, functionality that's only virtual in the base. Um, and this is the first layer where that shows up. And there are two big pieces here. Um, there's one that's the message passing layer, point to point messaging layer base. And then there's the one sided component, MPI RMA base. Um, and at least at LANL and some other places, um, and I'm not necessarily a total fan of it, but there's a lot of argument can be made that a one-sided MPI will have more importance in the future than it has now. And actually, the way this works inside OpenMPI has an impact on how these network APIs are either used or not used so efficiently. So what I'm showing here, before we go any deeper, is that um, for those cases where we don't have good network support for, for instance, atomics and real one-sided operations, uh, the way this one-sided component is structured is it has an option to go route all one-sided operations through point to point. And although that's practically impossible in the MPI 3 version of RMA, you can still kind of get away with it partly. Uh, the next big block goes all the way down to the network. Um, and I was not responsible for this, but you'll notice that there's abbreviations that make you think of Duke Skywalker, but we'll ignore that. Um, so there's this OB1, OB1 part, which does the actual message matching. And there's going to be a big empty space here, and now I'll explain what that's about. So this whole part of OpenMPI is centered around network APIs that are kind of dumb and are good at maybe doing puts and gets, sending and receiving, but no tag matching, none of the kind of functionality that you need to actually deliver uh, messages according to the MPI standard. And so in this case, the uh, OB1 component does message matching. Uh, and then below that, there's a little shim that can uh, theoretically, but usually not uh, in practice, strike the messages if they're going across, a, a, for instance, a network where you have multiple um, NICs that, for instance, Ethernet cards or HCAs. Um, but this, this isn't really that important. There's a BTL base, and then there are these various BTLs, byte transport layers. And there's one, for instance, for the Cisco USENIC, which actually now sits on top of a, of a libfabric using the specialized Cisco provider, um, but the libfabric interface isn't specialized. There's a VERBS BTL, you know, we'll see a little bit about that later. There's a UGENI BTL, one for TCP. Um, Vader, which is really shared memory, and then a little Portals 4 BTL, which sits on top of Portals. And this does, uh, this does non, uh, matching the kind of portals entry stuff uh, and not the tag matching that you might be more familiar with. On the OSC side, there's an RDMA variant of it which actually uses the network atomics that they're available. 
and puts and gets, and it uses components of this BTL base. This is relatively new, and this is part of what's impacted how we are either doing well or not doing well with these newer network APIs. And there's a shared memory part. And the little color scheme here, which when I converted to the new template didn't work out too well, is trying to show what parts of the software are community property and what parts tend to be more uh, assigned to a particular vendor. And I don't think the color actually works very well at all. No, what these, so the light purple is supposed to be ones where a given vendor or uh, institution focuses on that component. Uh, for a long time, we've had two other, another part. And so, oh, and the other important point here is that notice there's a simple mapping of, of a component like a verbs BTL to a verbs API, Eugeni to Eugeni. Uh, in this particular case, use NIC, NIC BTL to a particular type of lib fabric provider. So there's a tight coupling all the way down in this part between a particular upper level, in quotes, part of our open API and the API being used by the network. Um, over here is where there, the vendor uh, has provided a higher level API which can do tag matching. And so what I was trying to show here, right, there's more of a vendor part of the stack on these, except for Formula <coughs> 4, which is a special case. There's more of a vendor component in the stack between the top level application and the network. Um, uh, these things, we call these MTLs, which means message matching or tag matching uh, transport layer. And you notice they're smaller. Um, this one's a special case. Mellanox has both one way using MXM to go down to their MXM library and MXMTL. And then also they have a more direct thing where they've cut out even more of the open MPI and they have this little block called Yala. Um, these, this, ah, I keep forgetting. Um, these little pieces here are equivalent to this here, but they do no tag matching. Um, this part here would be kind of like what Ken's talking about with their CH4, because there's basically nothing very much between the MPI application and getting down to these to these components and then straight to the to the network API. One more block. Um, so this is the, o I'm sorry, two more. OFI MTL going down to Lib Fabric. That was the one that was added about a, uh, last December uh, 2014. And then more recently, the UCX uh, going into Open UCX. And in this, in this case, the Melox adopted the same strategy here as they did with the Yala MXM component. And don't ask me who Yala is. It's something from, from Star Wars too. Um, let's see what else. Oh, okay, now the big difference and this is what I want to talk, basically is the rest of the focus of the talk. Until these two pieces came in, everything was pretty simple. If you were using, uh, for instance, OmniPath 1, probably this was the preferred block to use, and it just went all the way up. Uh, PSM for TrueScale, uh, definitely for Mellanox HCAs, the MXM. So it was nice and simple. Now it's not so nice and simple because of the, the, what these two things have going on in them. Uh, two big components I don't show here, but they are very important. Orte and OSHMIM. I don't have time. If we had an hour, I could talk about the open SHMIM that's in this package, but there's not enough time. Okay, so briefly going back, we've already seen this. Lid fabric in boxes. Um, this is the thing that I was referring to. Uh, lid fabric can go through all these different paths, not just one, potentially. And to a lesser extent, but sort of the same problem. Um, Open UCX over here going through uh, uh, these different transports. Uh, they're all InfiniBand centric, but then there's also Jenny and there's also shared memory. Oh, one thing to point out, which will show up, which I can't demonstrate with any of the data I've gotten, is there's actually been a lot of work in the optimization of this for MLX5 that was what uh, the developers call uh, accelerated verbs. Okay, lessons learned. So as a net, as I told you I have seen this from both going, looking from down up or bottom up and top down. So one of the things we've been very active with with Cray is working on a Jenny provider. And uh, as far as having this stuff in OpenMPI, it's been fantastic because the OFI MTL was not written to a specific provider. I don't think the people who wrote that MTL cared or knew much about portals, which was good because it meant it just worked for us. Uh, it was from the get-go, once we got our tag matcher working, we could start using OpenMPI to test our provider. 
Uh, what was also nice is that if you were having problems, um, you could always say, well, let's see if the sockets provider works. And so you could just tell in, uh, OpenMPI or MPITS, we actually use both, um, to use sockets rather than to use your provider. <laughs> so I think for people who are developing things like LibFabric or um, OpenUCX, this is great. You know, it makes, it, makes life easier, sort of. You get more bugs reported, but that's okay. Um, for more op for MPI develop open MPI developers, it's definitely a mixed bag. Um, one of the biggest is that we're having problems right now with um, one of these APIs interfering with um, open MPI's way of, of intercepting malloc hooks. Um, the good news is that since the com well in this case both of these uh, both LibFabric and OpenUCX are open source. Uh, at least, you know, we can work with those developers and they don't have like a black box, which we're struggling to try and work around. But this is definitely something, as you try and add more and more functionality into the provider, oh, I need to back up. Okay. One thing that changed is because we want to support RDMA effectively, even if the application is using the open MPI to do the tag matching component over here, the way we have it working right now is OSC can still be using, for instance, we don't have it now, but we'll soon have um, an OFI BTL. We'd be using the OFI BTL's put get capabilities to do RDMA, but we'd be doing tag matching over here in the MTL component. And the same thing might theoretically happen in OpenUCX. So what that means is we can't just give all the functionality over to one of these components. For instance, the, uh, if you're having to work around issues with um, malloc hook interception. If, for instance, what's going on in here to deal with that causes problems with what's going on here to deal with that, we kind of have a problem. And it's, we're trying to figure out some good solutions there that we can hopefully all live with. Um, and kind of what Ken referred to, there are some pluses though. Uh, it means that we don't have to do quite as much, well, it's just, yeah. Actually, no, this is my feedback loop. Uh, we're learning now when we're using, the, uh, for instance, the uh, LibFabric um, uh, MTL, some things that we really think would be neat for some of these networks that maybe don't do quite what some of the others do. Uh, for end users, um, we've had to kind of deal with this uh, quickly. Um, one of the issues with having these LibFabric and OpenUCX, which can use different kinds of interconnects, is all of a sudden it can get quite confusing if uh, users and administrators are actually using an open MPI or an MPITCH, which has both, for instance, LibFabric and let's say IBVerbs support built in together. Um, then you begin to wonder, okay, well, I'm running over in Finiban, but what actually, which way am I going through my open MPI or MPITCH stack to actually get to that network? And in the case of, if I'm using one of these lower level APIs that supposedly works well over multiple fabrics, is that really the case? Um, am I really doing the best I can do with the network I've bought? So one of the first things we've done in master is to simplify it for the administrator at least. At the end of configure run, and this is an example, I think I did this on our Mustang. Uh, yeah, I did this on, no, I did this on the true scale one of the true scale clusters at Lionel. Um, this stuff isn't so important for this discussion, but down here we have transports, and it found no Cray, it found no Intel Omnipath. Um, it didn't find any SCIF, I don't know, think that even needs to be there now, but we did find true scale. There was no Mellanox, no UCX at uh, that build. Um, but it did find LibFabric, because that's there, and also because uh, the uh, uh, OFI was installed, OFED, I'm sorry, we found uh, open fabrics verbs. Uh, this feature is not in 110.2 or the 2.0, and I don't think we're going to put it in the 2.0, at least the 2.0 uh, X series. We might put it in 2.1. Okay, now here we get to the part. Yes, it is. Okay. This might be slightly controversial because I actually just I decided I decided you know I do this I decided to be a super friendly tester, and I would actually see how some of this stuff does because I work a little with UCX, I work a lot with LibFabric, I can build them all. I can go and get the software from HPCX from Melnox if I need it. And so I was just going to see what kind of numbers I'd get running some stuff. Um, the problem I have with like some of these diagrams is a 
potential buyer, along with Gary Greider, these systems, is I see these things, and oh, okay, so they filled in a bunch of things. Oh, I wonder what that really means. And the same thing up here. I got real excited when I found out we actually had verbs with EPRDM endpoint support. Good, okay. So now I can use on, the, on my Mellanox cluster, I can start using my EPRD endpoints. Well, let's actually see if that's really the case. Um, okay, so let's see. Sorry, I have to. Yeah. Okay, so what I did is um, I took two of our capacity uh, clusters at LAML. Uh, one of the older one, but the bigger one, is one that uses a AMD Opterons and Mellanox Connect X2. Yes, it's pretty old. And then the other one, um, was an Intel Sandy Bridge, true scale, is it Sandy Bridge, Susan? I think it's Sandy Bridge, right? Yep. Uh, and that, they're both PCIe Gen 2, so as far as uh, potential bandwidth uh, to the network and out, it's the same. I work with OpenMPI Master, no special config options, um, and except for those that we need to pick up lid fabric and open UCX installs. Fortunately, these are not defaults. Uh, you, uh, that is a, um, I believe that we have to specify with Lib Fabric and with Open UCX, or it doesn't look for them by default. Uh, I tried to. Oh no, that's not true. Uh, to, to get these to work, fortunately, you have to do a lot of uh, what I call MCA mag mag magic on the MPI run command line, which is a good thing because we actually don't want users really. That's one of the outcomes of this little experiment to be using either this or this at this point. I would not subject our LAML users to this software at this point. There's no way I'm going to deal with that. Oh, um, and so for, for Lib Fabric, I use master at this SHA and OpenUCX master at that SHA. Okay, so let's start with the Intel TrueScale cluster. And here I'm just running, I've just basic little stupid test. I'm not stupid, but basic. Uh, OSU latency test, uh, lower is better. And this is exactly what I would expect because the MT, uh, OFI MTL over PSM is just a, a little thin layer on top of, of, of PSM. And so performance-wise, there's very little penalty. But that's not really too interesting. It's been there for a year, nothing surprising. Um, the same thing for bandwidth. Um, this is OSU bi-directional. I decided to run bi-directional because it's a little more stressful uh, on the MPI. Um, that all looks good and it's exactly what I expect. Um, okay, so I tried to use UCX. And unfortunately, I found out a feature of the QLogic card is that it, it, first of all, has a max inline data of zero, which isn't very good. And it, right now, although we're going to fix it, UCX, it, you can't disable the path where they, you can use inline data. So I wasn't able to get any data off this system using UCX as it is. Um, not as surprising, but if you tried to use the Lib Fabrics. Uh, verbs provider, uh, MTL, OpenMPI MTL, is a disaster in terms of performance once you switch to using Rendezvous because it's trying to do one-sided and it can't do it. And if I included that data here, the line would be like down here. Okay, so let's switch to the Mellanox cluster. Um, same test, OSU latency, only going up to about actually 8K here. And so I have a bunch of different things. I have UCX using RC connections, uh, OFI verbs using RC, uh, MXM using RC, YALA using RC. These two are just the same. Remember, they j just a little YALA eliminated a little piece of M open MPI. And then OB1, which is the uh, stuff that my colleague at uh, Los Alamos coded up a few years ago. And the good thing is, is that, for instance, UCX here is actually doing, cons okay, so remember I said that uh, the UCX is being very optimized for MLX5. So if we were doing MLX5, I'd actually expect UCX RC to be down here with the MXM. But uh, on MLX4, like we have, it's just going through the IV verb, so there's more overhead. But even then, it's pretty good. It's almost down, uh, except for a little glitch here at, at 128 bytes, uh, not too far above MXM, which I thought was pretty good. Um, and OFI Verbs is doing not as well, but it's hanging in there, and I don't know what's happened. OB1, no one pays a lot of attention to it, and my experience with open source software is if you don't pay attention to it, it rots. Uh, so it's actually up above all the rest. Um, so in this case, this looks good. The uh, UCX and MXM seem to be kind of not too far off, especially modulo that uh, optimization for MLX5, which is certainly an MXM. 
Uh, things fall apart, though, for, all, for a bunch of stuff uh, once you go to the bidirectional bandwidth. Um, how much time do I have? Yeah. Am I good for time? Oh, ten okay, good for time. So there are a bunch of things going on here. Let's talk about OFI verbs because that one has a story in, in and of itself. And then uh, OB1, uh, it needs its own explanation. The only thing about OB1 is it's the only one here which I could get to do zero copy. Um, oh, I guess I should shut this off, sorry. I thought I was going to be clever and time myself. Okay. What's happening with OFI verbs, though, is important because it actually directly relates to one of the problem, one of the difficulties with using libfabric. What's happening here is it's doing great uh, uh, for eager protocol, but then once it switched to rendezvous, and remember this, we didn't touch the OFI MTL code at all. It was the stuff that came from the OmniPath crew at Intel who were working with TrueScale. Um, but now we see what happens when it actually is important to do memory registration of your send and receive buffers. And because that isn't supported in this right now, uh, what's happening is, is that for every send and receive, you're registering and deregistering your buffers. And everyone knows that's bad. Um, a little uh, uh, unsettling is that the OFI verbs provider, and it is um, hot out of the oven, so you know, I, I give them a break, we're going to fix it. It doesn't even say FI local MR, you should do it, which is a no no. That's actually a bug. It should be telling the OFI MTL that, hey, you should really be registering your send and receive buffers. Uh, and it doesn't even right now have ability to make use of that. Um, let's see, MXM and YALA, I had some issues on our system even when I got the most recent uh, uh, HPCX. We can't get it to work with RC for some reason. So this is the UC, and that's actually good performance when you're, you know, there's, I'm sorry, UD. Um, and this is just a protocol switch. Um, so actually, that's, that's what you'd expect if you were using uh, UD with ConnectX. Uh, and for MXM or YALA. Uh, we have some kind of strange glitch. I've been trying to find out from the Melnox guys what's going on there. Um, with the UC, uh, UCXRC, um, it's doing well with what it's doing, but right now it doesn't have support for zero copy, at least for this path through uh, the library. And I'm iterating with the uh, designer there about why, or one of the guys there, why we can't get it to do zero copy. That may be due to something about um, if it's running on MLX4, although I don't think so. So, but that's actually okay. We, uh, knowing what's going on, that this is exactly what you'd expect when you're using buffered path even for large messages. Um, let's see, right, that's one of the things I'm saying. Um, and this is the open verbs thing I just made a comment about. Okay, here's some conclusions. So. With the exception of probably TrueScale OmniPath 1, I would say that LibFabric and OpenUCX are works in progress, especially in the case of LibFabric for the verbs. Uh, and for OpenUCX, are these things which you just don't hit when, if you're only working with like you know, uh, Benlock's equipment, like the case of the inline data being zero, max inline data being zero on TrueScale. Uh, and so what this kind of tells me and what I tell users or if like my management was asking for suggestions is if I have high confidence that there's vendor focus on that particular, for instance, provider in LibFabric or for instance a particular transport layer in something like OpenUCX, probably things are going to be promising. But if they, it isn't an area of focus or it's an older interconnect, uh, it wouldn't promise too much. Uh, and then the final comment, which goes back to what I was talking about with Malik Cooks, it does help a lot for open source solutions. Um, I think I'd be very averse to recommending to my management to, for instance, take a lib fabric provider, which was closed source. I don't think I would ever tell Gary Greider to do that. Oh, this is my verbum uh, for students. Um, so we are busy at LANL and in MC hiring postdocs, postmasters. And this is stuff you can do. So I've started sticking this at, at the end of all my talks. Um, this is stuff you can do in the winter down near Sandia because it's, I mean, down near Albuquerque because it's nice and warm. Um, up here, this is the, one of the slopes on Santa Fe. And here's what you can do in Roswell. If they don't steal, <laughs> actually about two weeks ago, some high school kids stole, th not this thing, but the one that's on top of the museum, but I think they got it back. 
And these are the links to go either to LANL or the New Mexico Consortium to look for jobs. And that's it. So I have a question a little bit following on Jason's uh, question uh, from last time. So it seems like these MPI offerings are, um, it's positive that they're, they have all these uh, APIs and solutions, but it also seems like, it, as you said, it kind of complicates things. Yes. So um, part of the, the Lib Fabric approach was to try and reduce that, um, but UCX obviously has benefits so I mean where do you see all this going is I it seems to me it's going to continue to be um, a variety of options and you kind of have to get smart about how you build your MPIs and how you run them to get the best performance um, correct and also to have the most options among vendors for this solutions for your HPC workflows so I mean I don't see it going away I, I don't I don't I think they'll always be at least two if not three things you need to worry about um, the illusion that what I was referring to though with the particularly with the lip fabric is that there are all these different capabilities and Sean also talked about it with his, with his um, uh, utility provider but it makes it complicated like I've had experience now with several different things that were using lip fabrics and the one that was the easiest to use was the OFMTL because it wasn't like a coming from a background that was very specific to a particular network API that had a lot of features. Um, so that's one that's the one gotcha with that API I can see. Anything else? Okay. I think we're done for this session then, aren't we? No, we have one more. Okay. Thanks.